Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragon. This is episode 207 for February 15th, 2021. And we've got a new show for you today. Lots of things to catch you up on. Going to tell you about a really cool iOS, uh, that would be iPhone or iPad security system that was found by a Google researcher. Going to talk about how Amazon has revealed that their demands for user data from the government has spiked 800% in 2020. And also about yet another way in which Amazon's quote-unquote surveillance empire is being expanded radically. Of course, I'm going to talk about that Florida water treatment facility hack and how somebody tried to poison the small town by hacking into their computers and dumping a bunch of lye in the water. I'm going to tell you about a nasty Wi-Fi module bug that unfortunately will probably mean there's a ton of IoT devices out there that will probably never get fixed that will be vulnerable. There was a really interesting phishing attack that actually used Morse code. I'll explain how that works. We've been talking a lot about how Facebook and social media has been trying to contain hate speech and such. Well, Facebook has implemented what they are kind of nicknaming a Supreme Court to decide what things should be posted and whatnot, and that court has returned its verdict on a couple interesting, uh, interesting cases. We'll talk about that. Then we'll talk about Clubhouse. If you haven't heard of it yet, you, you will. It's the latest social media craze, and I'll tell you why you probably want to avoid it. And then Clearview AI is back in the news, so we'll catch you up on what's going on with them and uh, how at least some governments, un- <laughs> not the United States, is trying to curb their horrific facial recognition system. And that will lead into our tip of the week. Actually, I got a, got a couple, couple tips of the week for you, a little, little bit of a bonus this week. And after the news, I got a few more things to catch you up on, including going over the results of my annual listener survey. So stay tuned for that. But for now, let's get to the news. So I saw a couple articles this, uh, in recent weeks about this new technology that was discovered inside Apple's iOS, and it's, it's really cool. And it's kind of weird that Apple doesn't tout this more, but uh, nevertheless, it was a Google researcher, which seems a little ironic, but those, those guys do some great research. So a uh, researcher uh, digging around into iOS found this new technology that iOS has included since iOS 14 that helps to protect our the, uh, the Apple iMessage system. So let me just read this article. And this is from ZDNet. It says, with the release of iOS 14 last fall, Apple has added a new security system to iPhones and iPads to protect users against attacks carried out by the iMessage instant messaging client. Named Blast Door, this new iOS security feature was discovered by Samuel Gross, a security researcher from Project Zero, a Google security team tasked with finding vulnerabilities in commonly used software. Gross said the new Blast Door service is a basic sandbox type of security service that executes code separately from the rest of the operating system. While iOS ships with multiple sandbox mechanisms, Blast Door is a new addition that operates only at the level of the iMessage app. Its role is to take incoming messages and unpack and process their content inside a secure and isolated environment, where any malicious code hidden inside the message can't interact or harm the underlying operating system or retrieve user data. The need for a service like Blastdoor had become obvious after several security researchers had pointed out in the past that the iMessage service was doing a poor job of sanitizing incoming user data. Over the past three years, there's been multiple instances where security researchers or real-world attackers found iMessage remote code execution bugs and abused these issues to develop exploits that allowed them to take control over an iPhone just by sending a simple text, photo, or video in someone's device. The latest of these attacks took place last year over the summer and were detailed in a report from Citizen Lab named The Great iPhone, which described a hacking campaign that targeted Al Jazeera staffers and journalists. Gross said he was drawn to investigating iOS 14's internals after reading in the Citizen Lab report that the attacker's zero days stopped working after the launch of iOS 14, which apparently included improved security defenses. After a probing around in the iOS 14 inner workings for a week, Gross said he believes that Apple finally listened to the security research community and improved iMessage's handling of incoming content by adding the Blast Door sandbox to the iMessage's source code. And here's a quote from this researcher, Gross. He says, Overall, these changes are probably very close to the best that could have been done given the need for backwards compatibility, and they should have a significant impact on the security of iMessage and the platform as a whole. It's great to see Apple putting aside the resources for these kinds of large refactorings to improve end-user security. So yes, anytime you've got some piece of software that's in charge of interpreting something that it receives, that is input, and that input, as a security measure, needs to be very carefully scrubbed and any interpretation of that data you have to be very careful with how you do it because 
really clever hackers that understand your algorithms and your processes for parsing data can use that against you if you're not careful. And so Apple basically put some serious guardrails around this program in particular because it's obviously you can get lots of messages that you can get them from anywhere unsolicited. So iMessage is an obvious place where you need top-notch security. And again, I don't, I don't know why Apple wouldn't like come forward and, you know, tout these new security features. Maybe they're just trying not to tempt hackers, but nevertheless, it's good to know it's there. And it's great to know that Apple keeps cranking up their security. All right, moving on. Uh, I've got a couple stories here about Amazon and we've talked about them in the past, um, including interviewed folks from EFF and others about how their ring, their purchase of the ring video doorbells has really kind of kicked them off on this massive surveillance network that they seem to be building. And so it should be no surprise then that the government and law enforcement agencies are going to, you know, Amazon asking for data because that's, they've got a lot of it. So let me start first with this article from TechCrunch. New transparency figures released by Amazon show the company responded to a record number of government data demands in the last six months of 2020. The new figures land in the company's biannual transparency report published to Amazon's website over the weekend. Amazon said it processed 27,664 government demands for user data in the last six months of 2020, up from 3,222 data demands in the first six months of the year, an increase of close to 800%. That data includes shopping searches and data from its Echo, Fire, and Ring devices. The new report presents the data differently from previous transparency disclosures. Amazon now breaks down the top requesting countries. U.S. authorities historically made up the bulk of the overall demands Amazon receives, but this latest report shows Germany with 42% of all requests, followed by Spain with 18%, and Italy and the U.S. with 11% share each. But the report also removes the breakdown by legal process and now only differentiates between the requests it gets for users' content versus non-content. Amazon said it handed over user content data in 52 cases. But for its Amazon Web Services cloud businesses, which it reports separately, Amazon said it processed 523 data demands, with 75% of all requests made by U.S. authorities, and Amazon turned over users' content in 15 of those cases. An Amazon spokesperson would not say what led to the sharp rise in data demands, and Amazon seldom comments on its transparency reports. Amazon's transparency report is one of the lightest reads of all of the tech giants, at just three pages in length and spends most of the report explaining how it responds to each legal demand rather than on the data itself. The company, known for its notorious secrecy, became the last of the major tech giants to push out a transparency report in 2015, where most tech companies added data to their transparency reports, like takedown notices and account removals, Amazon bucked the trend by removing data from its reports, despite the company's growing reach into millions of homes. The Financial Times reported this week that Ring, the video doorbell and home security startup acquired by Amazon for $1 billion, now has 2,000 law enforcement partners across the United States, allowing police departments to access homeowners' doorbell camera footage. Now, we've talked about that before. It's supposedly Amazon asked the law enforcement communities to request that data, and the user has to approve before law enforcement can get access to their video doorbells. But they're really making it easy. I mean, in some cases, these police departments are actually selling Amazon Ring doorbells to their community at a discount with the understanding that uh, the users will install the special app that would, uh, that would allow them to give permission to the police department to actually basically use their video doorbells as a surveillance camera. But what's not clear to me is I, I think that if uh, law enforcement comes to Amazon with a warrant, I don't think they have to involve the user to get that footage. I could be wrong about that. But nevertheless, the, the possibility is certainly there. And all of this presumes that there's no hacking and no you know, software mistakes or rogue employees involved. Which makes this next story I'm about to read even more troubling. Uh, so this is from a website I don't recall hearing about before called commondreams.org. And I'll just read it and you'll understand what I'm getting at here. And what one leading digital rights advocate is calling, quote, the largest expansion of corporate surveillance in human history, unquote, Amazon has begun installing artificial intelligence equipped cameras in some of its partners delivery vehicles to monitor drivers while they work, a move that is raising broader concerns about privacy and corporate power. CNBC reported Wednesday that Amazon's AI powered four lens camera called driver eye, that's driver with no letter I are being tested in a handful of contracted delivery vehicles. The cameras record 100% of the time while vans are operating. 
They watch and record not only the drivers, but also the road and what's happening around the vehicles. Driver Eye cameras feature AI software that detects up to 16 different safety issues, tracking everything from driver's eye movements to speed and braking. Certain violations will trigger automatic audio alerts. And this is a quote from Carolina... Oh, God, I'm going to mess this up. Her- Harold's... I'm not even going to try. <laughs> she's... I've never seen a name like that. Uh, she's a senior Amazon manager for, quote-unquote, last mile safety. And there was an instructional video that they sent to their drivers, and this is a quote from that video. It says, Safety is our top priority at Amazon, and it's our hope that this new system will give drivers and DSPs, or delivery service partners, peace of mind while out delivering smiles to our customers. However, many drivers, who must agree to have the cameras installed, labor unions, and privacy advocates expressed alarm over the intrusive technology. Now, just reading that, it's kind of unclear if they mean that the drivers must agree to have them installed, or if they're only installed if the drivers agree. That's kind of phrased poorly. I'm not sure which that is. Anyway, back to the article. It says, in an online petition, the digital rights group Fight for the Future, great group, by the way, warns that, quote, Amazon will have roaming eyes in every neighborhood, shopping center, and intersection in our communities. And it goes on to say, Amazon will be watching everyone, including your kids, along with the millions of ring doorbell cams, floodlight cams, and mailbox cams. Amazon will have the perfect panopticon in place to sweep up unprecedented amounts of data en masse. They already have 2,000 plus partnerships with law enforcement, and it seems super likely that they'll start sharing footage from their vehicles the same way they share the, from the ring cameras, giving them access to license plates, biometric data, and enabling them to use facial recognition to track anyone's movements across neighborhoods and cities. Beyond fueling the expansion of the police surveillance state, this means even if you don't use Amazon, you're going to be in their system, being monitored and targeted, unquote. So in a statement, Fight for the Future Deputy Director Evan Greer says Amazon cameras will, quote, violate everyone's basic rights by constantly collecting and analyzing footage of our neighborhoods, our homes, and our children. Data, she says, can and will be shared with law enforcement, including U.S. Immigrations and Customs Enforcement, or ICE. And Greer goes on to say, quote, there are essentially no laws in place to limit what commercial purposes Amazon can use this enormous trove of video footage for, unquote. And Fight for the Future is demanding that Amazon immediately stop the rollout of this unsafe program and urging Congress to launch a full investigation into Amazon's surveillance empire. So, yeah, I mean, it's really, really obvious what Amazon is putting together here. And you've seen these trucks. You've seen these things. I mean, if if you've ordered anything from Amazon or anybody in your neighborhood has, you've seen these kind of dark gray, bluish vans with Amazon on the side, you know, driving around, dropping off packages Think of every one of those vans as an eye in the sky. This, I mean, this camera system sits like right under the, the rear view mirror in the, in the, inside the, the cabin and points forward, points to the driver and points out either side. Just think of how much data could be scooped up. And, and the article's right. I mean, I, I didn't even really think about that, but I mean, you know, license plate recognition technology is very common. It wouldn't be that hard. I mean, if you, basically, if you've got these the, these trucks driving around neighborhoods all the time, why wouldn't you think of other ways to monetize that data? So start by recording every face you see, every license plate you see, when you saw them, where they were. That gets really creepy really fast. So I just I just hope that, I, I think, honestly, I I think 2021 is going to be a turning point year. I, I think we're really going to finally start seeing privacy legislation pop up all over the place. Virginia is about ready to pass a law that's very similar to the one that California passed. Uh, I think three or four other states are in the process of doing the same thing, many of them just directly copying the language from uh, the two California laws that have passed in the last couple of years. And, uh, you know, we really need a federal law, however, and maybe under this administration that will happen. All right, next up, I'm sure you saw this in the news somewhere. Uh, this is the perfect kind of story for <laughs> for the nightly news or any other any other news site that wants to get you to read something. And that was about this hack of a Florida water facility in a a town in Florida I had never heard of called Oldsmar. So this is from The Verge, and uh, let me just read about this quote-unquote hack. By now, you've probably heard of the theoretically scary story of how hackers managed to infiltrate the computer systems at a water treatment plant in Oldsmar, Florida, and remotely control the chemical levels. But it turns out that description gives the hackers far, far too much credit. The reality? The water treatment plant itself left off-the-shelf remote control software on these critical computers and apparently never, ever bothered to change the password. An official cybersecurity advisory from the incident from the state of Massachusetts 
explains that the SCADA control system, that's S-C-A-D-A, and that's an acronym for something I forget, was accessed via TeamViewer, the kind of remote desktop application an IT administrator might roll out to remotely troubleshoot computers, not something you generally want hooked up to a critical system. More importantly, and here I just quote the Massachusetts Word report verbatim, quote, Further, all computers shared the same password for remote access and appeared to be connected directly to the Internet without any type of firewall protection installed, unquote. Yes, just like Florida's Department of Health, and it links to another article, I guess this happened there too, this Florida water treatment plant apparently didn't bother to issue individual passwords for software that could give anyone complete access to any of their computers and their water treatment system. In other words, any employee could adjust the town's water supply on a whim from anywhere in the world, which is probably what happened. Former U.S. cybersecurity czar Christopher Krebs testified earlier today that it was very likely, quote-unquote, an insider, possibly a disgruntled employee, someone who would already have access which wouldn't make this much of a hack at all. In later remarks, Krebs clarifies, quote, it's possible this was an insider or a disgruntled employee. It's also possible it's a foreign actor. But we should not jump to a conclusion that it's a sophisticated adversary, end quote. So what happened was, apparently during the day, uh, which was mistake number one, whoever this hacker was, and I don't believe at this point they've identified who it was, logged in to one of the control systems using this remote desktop software. And if you've ever, you know, supported somebody remotely with this, you know what I'm talking about. You basically, from your computer, log into their computer, and you can control it and move your mouse around and click on things and type in stuff and as if you were there. And so some employee who was sitting there next to one of these computers noticed that the mouse started moving, the mouse pointer, and things started happening on this computer. And what this person was doing was changing the amount of lye or sodium hydroxide in the water levels. Uh, I think increased it like a hundred times the parts per million that it was supposed to be at. Obviously, lye is not something you want to drink, but I guess in very small quantities that's used to kill bacteria and help clean the water. So somehow this system allowed for ridiculous amounts, poisonous amounts of lye to be added to the water, which that's weird. And this person in the middle, in the middle of the day logged in using this remote control software that was exposed to the internet with a single password that everybody at the company knew to change these values to a poisonous level. And because somebody was sitting there and watched it happen, uh, they could quickly undo it. And apparently, supposedly, there are other control systems that would have caught this um, if this person hadn't seen it. But nevertheless, it's it's hardly a hack. So the broader, broader picture here is uh, these SCADA systems are used all over the place. The security for these Things are probably horrible, if non-existent, like in this case. Our our infrastructure is just begging for these things to happen. And we really, really, really need to get on top of this. This is going to require a coordinated effort from the federal, uh, state, and local level to get on, get on the ball and start. I'm sure there's going to be some regulations that need to come out of this and just general training. But anyway, at least in this case, uh, nothing bad had ended up happening, but whew, sure could have. Okay, moving on. Um, this is a article from IT Pro about some um, nasty bugs found in Wi-Fi hardware modules. Um, and I'll explain. There's there's some technical terms in here. Don't worry about them too much. Uh, I'll talk about this at the end to explain my take on this. So, uh, security researchers have discovered several flaws in the Realtek RTL 8195A Wi-Fi module that could allow cyber criminals to gain remote root access to the Wi-Fi module and ultimately take complete control of the device's wireless communications. So again, root access is kind of like God access on a computer system. If you can, if you can get root access, you can do anything. According to a blog post by Israeli cybersecurity firm Vidu, V-D-O-O, the module is a compact, low-power Wi-Fi module targeted at embedded device users in the agricultural, automotive, energy, smart home, healthcare, gaming, and security industries. <laughs> so basically everything. The most severe of the six flaws researchers found is a remote stack overflow that allows an attacker near an RTL 8195 module to take it over. The attacker wouldn't need the Wi-Fi network password, and it wouldn't matter if the module is acting as a Wi-Fi access point or a client. 
Researchers said any version of the module built after April 21st, 2020 are not affected by the vulnerabilities, while modules built after March 30th, 2020 are protected from the most severe stack overflow exploit, but are still vulnerable to, other, to all other flaws and will need patching. Users can download an updated version of the Amoeba SDK, and it goes on to give a link to that website. But it says if users can't update the device's firmware, re researchers advised using a strong private WPA passphrase to prevent exploitation. Stephen Kapp, CTO and founder of Cortex Insight, told IT Pro that depending on the device function, there could be hundreds of devices, if not more, running vulnerable hardware modules. And by hundreds of devices, I, don't, I think he means hundreds of types of devices, like different, hundreds of products, and which would mean thousands or tens of thousands of devices or more and more. Uh, and this is a quote from Stephen Kapp. It says, quote, As a result, it is good practice to treat IoT devices as insecure by default and build controls around them to minimize risk. In this case, for example, it is difficult to know what devices have the vulnerable Realtek Wi-Fi module within them, unquote. Cap said it would be impossible for end users to know if they need to update their device, making it the vendor's responsibility to release an update that installs the patched firmware on the device. And that's quote, he's quoted one more time. He says, quote, it looks like the most serious of the vulnerabilities released in the Realtek 8195A module do not require knowledge of the Wi-Fi password to exploit and thus use affected devices to gain access to networks containing the device. Therefore, if possible, it's recommended to install any available firmware updates and ensure network-level controls are in place to minimize the risk of the device being used as a stepping stone into a wider environment, unquote. Okay, so yes, this, <laughs> this is a definite problem, uh, but it really goes to show that there's a much, much bigger problem here, and that is a lot of these, a lot of these devices that we, that we buy, even though they come from different manufacturers, do have a lot of common parts. And some of these common parts, like these Wi-Fi modules, are going to have security problems. It's, it's just the nature of the beast. The real issue here is that there's no real way for you as a small business owner or any business owner or just regular consumer to know which of your devices have this chip built into it and whether or not that chip has vulnerable versions of the software running on it. Furthermore, a lot of these devices probably even aren't upgradable, even if you did know that a certain device in your network was vulnerable uh, and had software on it that had these bugs, you might not be able to update that software, which basically means you need to throw the device out. And so there are really several takeaways from this. First of all, we really need some basic guidelines and regulations around the manufacture of these devices. First of all, anything with software on it, which today is just about anything electronic, needs to be upgradable. Ideally, they should automatically upgrade. Certainly, if they are on the internet in any way, shape, or form, they should be able to upgrade themselves automatically. Now, of course, that could have its own problems, but <laughs> let's, let's start with the fact that at least as long as we get the update mechanism to be secure and verified, that all these devices can upgrade themselves so that users don't have to worry about it. But also, and this is something I'm actually hoping to talk to somebody. I don't want to give too much away because it may not happen, but there was somebody I ran across on Twitter that is in the U.S. government that works on a project where they're trying to put in place standards that would allow all of these IoT devices, when queried, to report what they're made of, basically. What software they're running, and, and I don't just mean the overall software load, because software today is, is Frankenstein clumps of various SDKs and libraries all put together. So it really needs what we call a software bill of materials or an SBOM. And in this case, we would want a hardware bill of materials, which is the more common use of BOM. So if I've got a networked device running software somewhere in my home or in my business, I should be able to have some sort of a system that can query it and find out, hey, what are you? What pieces of hardware are you running? What versions are those pieces of hardware? What software are you running? What components make up that software? What is the individual versions of all those software components? And where do I go to find out if there's a software update and how do I install that update? While that sounds complicated, it's really not. It's something that this should be standard operating procedure for any IoT device we create. Now, the flip side of that is if you're a hacker, that actually that makes your job easier as well. Because if you're, let, let's say, uh, I've got a hacked device in your network and I'm running malware, I can then, with that malware, scan your entire network and query every device in your network to basically find out which of those devices are vulnerable. So it does cope, you know, transparency and information does cut both ways. 
But in this case, I think the advantage goes to the uh, the owner operator so that these devices can be monitored and updated as necessary. All right, moving on. This was a fun story. I had to include it. This is from Bleeping Computer. It's about a phishing attack that used Morse code. Uh, let me read the article. A new targeted phishing campaign includes the novel obfuscation technique of using Morse code to hide malicious URLs in an email attachment. Samuel Morse and, Al and Alfred Vail invented Morse code as a way for transmitting messages across telegraph wire. When using Morse code, each letter and number is encoded as a series of dots, or a short sound, and dashes, or a long sound. Starting last week, a threat actor began utilizing Morse code to hide malicious URLs in their phishing form to bypass secure mail gateways and mail filters. Bleeping Computer could not find any references to Morse code being used in phishing attacks in the past, making this a novel obfuscation technique. After first learning of this attack from a post on Reddit, Bleeping Computer was able to find numerous examples of the targeted attack uploaded to VirusTotal since February 2nd of 2021. The phishing attack starts with an email pretending to be an invoice for the company with the mail subject like Revenue Payment Invoice February Wednesday 0203 2021. This email includes an HTML attachment named in such a way as to appear to be an Excel invoice for the company. These attachments are named in the format Company Name Underscore Invoice Underscore Number dot underscore xlsx underscore html. For example, if bleepy computer was targeted, the attachment could be named bleepy computer underscore invoice underscore 1308 dot underscore xlsx dot html. So notice what's going on there. It's kind of made to look like a spreadsheet with that dot xls in there, but that's not the true, uh, that's not the true end of the file. It's actually an html file. When viewing the attachment in a text editor, you can see that they include JavaScript that maps letters and numbers to Morse code. For example, the letter A is mapped to dot dash, and the letter B is mapped to dash dot dot dot. The script then calls a decode Morse function to decode a Morse code string into a hexadecimal string. This hexadecimal string is further decoded into JavaScript tags that are injected into the HTML page. These injected scripts combined with the HTML attachment contain the various resources necessary to render a fake Excel spreadsheet that states their sign-in timed out and prompts them to enter their password again. Once a user enters their password, the form will submit the password to a remote site where the attackers can collect the login credentials. This campaign is highly targeted, with the threat actor using logo.clearbit.com service to insert logos for the recipient's companies into the login form to make it look more convincing. If a logo is not available, it uses the generic Office 365 logo, as shown in the image above, which, of course, you can't see. Bleepy Computer has seen 11 companies targeted by this phishing attack, including SGS, Dimensional, Metrome, SBI or Moratitious Limited, Nouveau IMAIE, Bridgestone, Cargas, ODDOBHF Asset Management, Dia Capital, Equinti, and Capital 4. I've maybe only heard of one of those. Phishing scams are becoming more intricate every day as mail gateways become better at detecting malicious emails. Due to this, everyone must pay close attention to URLs and attachment names before submitting any information. If something looks at all suspicious, recipients should contact their network administrators to invest investigate further. As this phishing email uses attachments with double extensions, which I mentioned, XLXS and HTML, it's important to make sure that Windows file extensions are enabled to make it easier to spot suspicious attachments. And so that last line was key. In Windows, as on Mac, in most cases, the little file extensions like .doc or .xls or .txt or .exe, .pdf, these kind of things that were used a long time ago to kind of determine what kind of a file something is, are often hidden by the operating system. And especially when it comes to things like attachments or, you know, files that you didn't create yourself, anything you download in any way, shape, or form, you do not want to be hiding those ex file extensions. On Windows and on Mac OS, you can go into your Finder on Mac OS or into Windows Explorer and find the settings for showing file extensions. You can have it always show you the file extension. It's kind of ugly and kind of hokey, but, um, you know, at least when you're dealing with, you know, files that are, are of unknown provenance, that is really the safest way to have it, to know what it is because a lot of times these bad guys will, you know, put an icon on a file that makes it look like a PDF when in actuality it's an executable. So you go to double click it, you know, thinking you're just going to open up a PDF file. And what you've really done is you've executed malware. All right. Next up, we talked with Troy Hunt uh, at length about free speech and deplatforming and, uh, and what happened recently. And of course that 
centered a lot around Facebook and Twitter. And one thing we didn't really talk about, I don't believe, is both Facebook and Twitter have recently created these sort of advisory panels to help, you know, give some sort of an independent oversight oversight into, you know, what sort of content or groups or people that they ban. Twitter's is kind of funny. I think they call it bird watchers. Facebook's one is uh, a panel that is, they kind of call Facebook's Supreme Court. I don't think that's the official name, but um, that's kind of the uh, the moniker that it's been given. And so anyway, this board that was created last year has actually come back and rendered some decisions um, uh, for Facebook on, I think, five different cases, five different controversial cases. And let me just read this article from NPR and then we'll talk about it. Facebook's oversight board on Thursday directed the company to restore several posts that the social network had removed for breaking its rules on hate speech, harmful misinformation, and other matters. The decisions are the first rulings of the board, which Facebook created last year as a kind of Supreme Court, casting the final votes on the hardest calls the company makes about what it does and does not allow users to post. The rulings announced on Thursday do not include the most high-profile and high-stakes case on the board's docket. Facebook's suspension of former President Donald Trump from both its namesake platform and Instagram, which the company owns. Facebook banned Trump earlier this month after, and of course this was in January, earlier this month after a mob of his supporters stormed the U.S. Capitol. The Trump case, which the board has 90 days to consider since receiving it last week, and of course this, again, this article is from a couple weeks ago, is seen as a crucial test of the panel's legitimacy. The board will begin taking public comment on it on Friday, and I guess that, that would mean it's already doing so. Still, Thursday's decisions are an important first glimpse into how the board sees its governance role, and indicated skepticism among members with how Facebook has communicated and enforced several key policies. And this is a quote from one of the board members, and her name is Hel Thorning Schmidt, and she was a former prime minister of Denmark, and she's one of the board's uh, four co-chairs. And she said, quote, We believe the board has the ability to provide a critical independent check on how Facebook moderates content and to begin reshaping the company's policy over the long term, unquote. And then this article actually goes through, and uh, there were five cases, and four of them were overturned, meaning that they were not, they were unbanned. <laughs> they were allowed to, the posts were allowed to go back um, after review. Uh, I'm not going to go into each of those four examples, or each of those five examples, but I'll continue the article. It says, Facebook has said it will abide by the board's decisions. It has already reinstated the posts the board said shouldn't have come down. The board also issued recommendations that, for, that Facebook be more transparent, including explaining to users whose posts are removed, which rules they had violated, and giving more clarity and definitions for, for issues, including health misinformation and dangerous individuals. Facebook has 30 days to respond to the board. And then Facebook's Vice President Monica Bickert said, quote, We believe that the board included some important suggestions that we will take to heart. Their recommendations will have a lasting impact on how we structure our policies, unquote. Evelyn Duke, a Harvard Law professor lecturer who studies online content moderation, said the board's inaugural rulings, quote, are a true shot across the bow, unquote, because they take aim not just at Facebook's handling of individual posts, but its broader policies and enforcement. And quoting from her again, she says, now the question is, how serious will Facebook take these recommendations and how openly will it engage with what the board said, unquote? The board is funded by Facebook through an independent trust and made up of 20 experts of around, from around the world. They include specialists in law and human rights, a Nobel Peace Laureate from Yemen, the vice president of the Libertarian Cato Institute, and several former journalists. Each case was reviewed by a group of five randomly selected members and the final decision approved by the full board. Okay, so anyway, I just thought that was interesting, especially given the conversation we just had with Troy Hunt and a conversation we will, we will be having soon with Phil Zimmerman. Yes, yeah, I finally, <laughs> finally managed to get him interviewed. That will be coming up in a few weeks. So, you know, it's interesting. I don't know where this is going to go. I don't know how much effect this has. I don't really know, you know, I think Facebook is free to ignore their recommendation. So I'm not, you know, it remains to be seen, you know, how much good this will do. But it's, it's interesting and we'll need to keep an eye on it. All right, next up. Have you heard of Clubhouse? Uh, it's the latest and greatest social media craze. Uh, it's supposedly still in beta. It's currently invite only. So you may have heard about it in the news, but the only way currently, as of the time I taped this, to join was for somebody else who's already in the clubhouse to invite you. But how they're doing this is all very creepy, and they're really not handling the privacy stuff very well. So here's uh, an article from Vox.com. Did you get an invitation to join Clubhouse, the invite-only app that seemingly everyone is talking about? Before you decide to join the Cool Kids Club, you might want to consider who will see you there, even if you take every available measure to keep your contacts private. 
Clubhouse is an audio-based app, still in beta, that allows users to create and join rooms where all kinds of topics are discussed. You can join speaking events or you can make your own room to chat. There's also a big social component. You follow people, people follow you, and Clubhouse very much encourages these networks to form and grow. And as One Zeros, and One Zero is the name of a company or organization, as One Zeros Will Oramus reported on Thursday, that's led to a few privacy issues some Clubhouse users didn't expect and can't avoid given the app's lack of privacy controls or information about them. The primary piece of Clubhouse's user recommendation and user recommendation engine relies on access to your contacts. You actually can't invite anyone else to the platform if you don't grant access to your contacts. If you do give the app access, Clubhouse will show you everyone on your contact list who is also on Clubhouse. It will also urge you to invite those who aren't and let you know as soon as someone in your contacts has joined so you can say hello to them. This is all pretty standard for an app trying to gain new users. But what if you didn't give Clubhouse access to your contacts, specifically because you didn't want all or any of them to know you were there? Which, by the way, seems kind of weird since you're joining a social media platform, but anyway. I regret to inform you that Clubhouse has made it possible for them to know anyway, encourages them to follow you, and there isn't much you can do about it. When I joined, I didn't give Clubhouse access to my contacts. As has been my policy since childhood, only I may decide who enters my Clubhouse. That was clever. Nevertheless, a few minutes later, I had a bunch of followers from my contacts. Even worse, I got followers who weren't in my contacts at all. But I was in theirs. It turns out that your privacy on Clubhouse depends not just on what you do, but also on what those who have your information in their contacts do. For now, you can only get invited to Clubhouse through your phone number, which is attached to your account and can't be removed. So if someone has your phone number in their contacts, and they've given Clubhouse access to those contacts, they'll get a notification when you join the app and a recommendation to follow you. Clubhouse also encourages you to connect your Twitter and Instagram accounts, which could be another way for you to find people or for people to find you. Clubhouse did not respond to a request for comment on if or how the app does this, but it's something to consider before you connect your social media accounts. To be clear, Clubhouse isn't the only app that is overly aggressive with its connection recommendations. Plenty of social media platforms use algorithms that take various factors into account, including your personal data and your contacts, to suggest people you should friend or follow and yet somehow not powerful enough to avoid making recommendations that are creepy. Remember all those stories about Facebook's quote-unquote people you may know feature that recommended psychiatrists to their patients, or random people they passed by on the street to each other? Facebook admitted that it recommended people based on their contacts, even if they weren't in yours. But Facebook, which is hardly a shining beacon of best practices when it comes to privacy, now has a bunch of settings and ways to keep your profile reasonably locked down if you want it to be. But you also don't have to link your phone number to your Facebook profile. At least now you don't. I think for a while you did. And if you have a certain kind of Facebook account, you do, like mine. So anyway, <laughs> Clubhouse is just the latest kid on the block. If you get an invite, understand what you're getting yourself into. All right, last up. And this this is from actually a blog from Tutanota, which is one of the privacy-respecting email services that I use. And it's kind of meandering, so I apologize. It kind of goes back and forth on different things, but I didn't really find a good way to summarize other than just straight up reading it. So I'm going to do that. But basically there's new news about Clearview AI, and we've talked about them a few times before. In fact, it was just about a year ago. If you back, uh, go back to episode 151 on January 20th, uh, or episode 157 on March 2nd, uh, we talked about them uh, twice, actually. There was a lot of stuff in the news with them back then. Well, they're back. And this one has to do with uh, some new rulings in the EU and Canada, some welcome rulings. So let me kind of muddle my way through this through this article, and then we'll talk about it. When the Clearview scandal hit the public, everyone expected that Clearview would have to answer to government officials for its data abuse. As it turns out, the opposite is the case. Governments are too eager to use the facial recognition software themselves. They seem to have no interest to regulate Clearview. Now, about one year after the scandal hit the public, a German and Canadian court decided in two separate cases that Clearview's creation of biometric profiles is illegal, and that Clearview must delete profiles upon request. This is a first step, but not enough to protect people's right to privacy. As a citizen of Europe, Canada, or California, privacy laws such as GDPR or CCPA enable you to demand from Clearview AI to delete your data. We call on every citizen of Europe, Canada, and California to force Clearview to delete their data. Here's how to opt out, and it's a link, and I'll actually walk through that as part of the tip of the week. A German court has now decided officially that Clearview is not allowed to create biometric profiles of European citizens and must therefore comply with deletion requests. A Canadian court issued a very similar ruling last week. 
The Canadian ruling goes a step further than the German one, as it has told Clearview AI, quote, to cease offering its facial recognition services in Canada, cease scraping of Canadians' faces, and to delete images already collected, unquote. While this is a first step, it's not enough to protect people's privacy. Clearview's business practices contradicts the human right to privacy. Clearview collects pictures online, combining these pictures with information about people, like Facebook profiles, etc., which helps to identify the real person behind the pictures. The people concerned never gave consent that their information online may be used in such a way. They might not even have published this information themselves, just think about doxing. And doxing, if you haven't heard the term, is basically maliciously publishing a lot of data about somebody, their documents. To protect citizens' right to privacy, the business practice of Clearview AI must be declared illegal as such. For now, all we can do as individuals is make Clearview delete our data. We encourage everyone to ask Clearview for a copy of their data and demand the company to completely erase their profile from the Clearview database. It's incredibly scary that anyone can take a picture of you, upload it to the web, and some system scrapes it and sells your data to others, governments, marketing agencies, or whoever is interested in spying on other people. The software also combines the pictures with other information like names, social security numbers, holiday information, or CVs, or, or curriculum vitae, basically your resume. It can be any information that is posted along with pictures. This software denies every citizen to control their own pictures, their own identity. Jeremy D. Scott, Senior Counsel at Electronic Privacy Information Center, comments on Vice. And by the way, he was with the EFF and we had him on, <laughs> and we had him on the show about this exact issue back in September 23rd about facial recognition. That's uh, September 23rd, 2019, episode 134, in case you want to go back and check that out. Anyway, he says, quote, The face search results show exactly why we need a moratorium on face surveillance. In a democratic society, we should not accept our images being secretly collected and retained to create a massive surveillance database to be used, disclosed, and analyzed at the whim of an un unaccountable company. The threat to our constitutional rights and democracy is too great. Our participation in society should not come with the price tag of our privacy, unquote. Clearview states on their website that the app is, quote, available only for law enforcement agencies and select security professionals to use as an investigative tool, unquote. However, this may not be entirely true. In a search for investors, Clearview gave access to potential investors as a perk. For instance, the actor Ashton Kutcher described an app just like Clearview on YouTube, and he says, quote, I have an app in my phone in my pocket right now. It's, a, it's like a beta app. It's a facial recognition app. I can hold it up to anybody's face here and, like, find exactly who you are, what internet accounts you're on, what they look like. It's terrifying, unquote. So can anyone use the Clearview app? No, it's not publicly available. However, it is obviously not just law enforcement agencies that have access to the app. To date, Clearview has not published a list of customers that are using the Clearview app right now. At this point, no one can know who might have access to this tool. Besides, with the incredible amount of abuse you can do with this kind of information, it's only a matter of time until criminals will find a way to use, abuse, or rebuild the app. Better start deleting all your online pictures now, or go undercover, like these artists. And again, it gives a link, and it's kind of funny, though, if you look at it, I'll have to describe it to you. Uh, these artists are basically coming up with bizarre makeup techniques that make facial recognition extremely difficult. It's like camouflage for your face, but not to blend in with trees and your surroundings, but to make it harder for facial recognition systems to find your face and figure out who you are. Okay, so let's get to our tip of the week. And it's this one's pretty straightforward, and it's not for everybody. Unfortunately, in the U.S., it's for only people who live in California. In fact, generally speaking, uh, as the article kind of alluded to, it's for people in California, in the European Union, also apparently in uh, the U.K., uh, Switzerland, and Australia. And I definitely know we have listeners in those areas, so... Um, you need to go to clearview.ai, that's the website name, clearview, all one word, dot AI, slash privacy slash requests. Uh, that's the link that I mentioned that was in the article. And if you go there, it'll give you kind of this short thing about privacy request forms. Depending on where you live, you have different options. In some cases, you can actually fully opt out. In some cases, you could just request your data. Uh, others, you can request data deletion. Uh, if it were me, and if I lived in one of these places, what I would do is I would first access my data. I would ask for them to send me everything they have on me because I would want to know and download that. Uh, then I would opt out and then I would ask them to delete everything they have on me. But bare minimum, I would ask them to delete everything. I would just like to know what they have on me first and, you know, kind of formally tell them to stop it just to <laughs> register my disdain. So uh, for those of you who have that ability, uh, and you can find out again, if you go there, it'll tell you who this applies to. 
Just go to clearview.ai slash privacy slash requests. And uh, as always, I will put this in the show notes. But I want to give you one more because it is that time. It's tax time. And I know we're going to have interviews for a little bit. And I didn't want to wait uh, any longer for this one. And I kind of trot this out every year. But it's important to be thinking about it. Uh, for those of you in the United States with tax time coming up, now is the time to really beware of tax scams. So uh, I've got a whole blog entry on this. And I will put the link in the show notes. But if you just go to firewallsdon'tstopdragons.com, uh, should be the top article or very close. But just you know, to kind of quickly go through what I go through there, uh, the, the kind of the points I make is, first of all, file early uh, if you can. File basically before the bad guys do it for you. Uh, with identity theft, with re tax return fraud, basically what they do is if they have their social security number or find, uh, I think they have to at least have that. But if, if they can get in there and register an account and file a tax return as you, they can make up you know, all sorts of crazy refunds and things that you're due. And uh, there are some weird ways that they can kind of fool the system in order to get that money not sent to you as a check and to the address of register. Uh, they can, they can do it. They've done it. So one of your defenses against that is to just file as soon as you can. Uh, another one though, is this thing called an IP pin. And I forget inter in identity protection, I think is what the IP is for. Uh, and until this year, I believe in the United States, the only people who could apply for that were people who were verified victims of, of identity theft. And you would have had to have filed a special form and yada, yada, yada. But now this year as, uh, for tax year 2020 and, and 2021, anybody can ask for this pin. So, uh, again, if you go to the website, you'll get the link, but if you just, or you can just go to the irs.gov and search on IP pin. And there's a button to get your PIN, and you'll, you'll have to go through a verification process. You may have to create an account, which is another good thing to do. Go ahead and create your IRS account if you haven't already. Unfortunately, you've got to get this PIN every year. So <laughs> I guess that's a one-time, one-year thing. Uh, but if you get that, then no one, no one else without that PIN could file a tax return in your name. So I would recommend you do that. Uh, also, just you know, be extra careful about tax phishing scams uh, or just tax scams in general. The IRS is never going to call you or email you and say, if you don't reply with a payment, we're going to send you to jail or that they, they don't work that way. They will send something to your address of record, uh, some sort of official letter or form. You'll get it that way. And then at that point, if you do get something like that, you can give them a call. If somebody does call you and claims to be from the IRS, just hang up. It's not them. Or if you're really worried that it's them, call them right back. Uh, and I'm sure that if it really was something that they need your attention with, then they will have it on record. And when you get through, finally, it's a long wait, unfortunately, uh, they will have that on record and you can talk to them about it then. And by the way, if you do get an email that is an obvious phishing scam email, uh, you can send that to phishing, and that's P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G, at irs.gov. If you forward that email to them, they would like that. Uh, it helps them kind of see the scams that are going on and you can alert them that you or someone try to fish you. Uh, one of the other things that we tend to do, especially now during COVID, when we're not supposed to be going out in public and seeing people, is you may need to send confidential tax information to, let's say, your tax preparer. Or maybe someone needs to send you something. And you definitely want to encrypt any of those kind of files that you send. Emails and attachments to emails are generally not encrypted by default. Uh, now, in transit, they are, which means, you know, as those packets bounce around the web, they are. But point to point, like between, you know, your computer and your email server and your recipient's email server and your recipient, that's four points if you think about it. Uh, at each of those hops along the way, they're often not encrypted, which means that there's a copy sitting there, which could be there for a long time. And somebody could eventually find and dig around and get your information and perhaps use it for identity theft. So you definitely want to encrypt your files, anything like that, that's sensitive, medical information, financial information, uh, any of those kind of things, you want to encrypt it. And so it's way too much to get into here, but that same article I just talked to you about links to one of the most popular articles on my website about how to send files securely. So you'll find that link in there as well. And then finally, this is still an issue, though the government keeps trying to stamp this out, but there's still a lot of scams, a lot of bait and switch scams with the big, you know... TurboTax and some of these other guys that have tried, I guess I don't know that they're doing it this year, uh, but they certainly have in years past gotten busted for, you know, starting you off on what they call a free file tax return, which is your legal right under certain conditions, if you meet certain requirements, to be able to file for free. But they usually have two products. There's one free file product, which is the official government-sponsored one that cannot ever cost you money. 
And then there's the one that they start you on, which invariably you run into something, oh, sorry, you can't do that for free. That's going to cost you money. You've got to bump up to deluxe or whatever. And I've got an article based on that too. So if you just go to my website, go to firewallstonesubdragons.com, find that tax scam article, and there's all the links in there to all these things I've talked to you about that'll help you avoid all of those things. So there you go. There's your uh, twofer tip of the week. All right, before we wrap up, a couple things I wanted to go through the uh, listener survey results. I didn't get nearly as many as I'd hoped, so I'm not sure exactly how representative this is of my audience. It's actually a pretty small portion of the audience, so keep that in mind as I read these numbers. But um, uh, here's just some interesting points that I did find out. I wanted to go through it really quick. Um, first of all, uh, <laughs> almost 90% male. Uh, I hope that's not the true number for the entire listening audience. I don't, you know, I could see it might skew a little bit male, but uh, hopefully it's not that skewed. Very wide range of ages, which I think is great. Um, you know, maybe if you kind of totaled up, there's like 60% uh, of you uh, that responded or were between 30 and 49, which, you know, I kind of... Kind of makes sense, but they're from all over the spectrum, which is great. I also, you know, asked how long you've been a listener, and that and that number varied uh, quite a bit as well. And there's quite a few new ones, which is which is wonderful. Uh, I asked how long you think my podcast should be, and then pretty much evenly split between thirty to forty five minutes and forty five to sixty minutes. And some odd people who wanted more, and some odd people wanted less. Um, but generally speaking, most of you kind of liked where we're at, which is good. Also, the vast majority of you liked the current balance between news and interviews, so that's also great to know. Those of you uh, who responded have a wide mix of device types, Apple, Windows, Android, uh, various IT, IoT devices. I also asked how you found my podcast, and there was a variety of answers there too, but the big ones, uh, the top two, were either searching within your podcast app or doing an internet search. And that is why reviews are crucial. Uh, that is what brings those uh, search results to the top. And by the way, I did get a new podcast review. Thank you very much. I'll read that here in a second. Most people said that they listened for their own benefit, which is not surprising. Uh, the top two runner-ups, though, were either for your parents or for your spouse. And, and then a third one was for your friends. So great. That, that is wonderful. Glad to hear that. Many of you have checked out the book, the blog, and the newsletter, which is great, and or, and or uh, referred them to others. Also great. And a lot of you follow me on Twitter, which is great. And some of you follow me on Facebook, and some of you, of course, are patrons. So I appreciate that. And I'll just say it again, if you want, like, truly up-to-date stuff, like there's a virus active right now, or there's a scam going on right now that you've got to be aware of, you know, where I usually post those is Twitter and Facebook. I will almost surely talk about them here, but, you know, if you really want the bleeding edge, the, 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 the breaking news, uh, that's where you're going to want to follow me. Now, I also asked some more open-ended questions. I asked, like, uh, one of my questions is, you know, what do you, what do you worry about? What keeps you up at night? Identity theft, there was a big one there. People talked about, you know, data breaches, which, you know, unfortunately happen all the time. Surveillance showed up in various different ways. Some people very, you know, very frustrated that a lot of people they know don't seem to care and are much more willing to give up cost and convenience for privacy. A lot of people were very frustrated about, you know, dealing with tracking and trying to block cookies and block JavaScript and trying to opt out of everything. I, I feel you there. And ransomware. Ransom, somebody, somebody mentioned that as well. Hopefully no one's been a victim here, but uh, yeah, that, that is a nasty one too, and that is certainly a sign of our times. I asked people what they like and what things they might change. Uh, most people had really nice, very complimentary things to say. I Thank you very much. And I would say I don't think anything really stuck out in terms of like a trend and uh, you know, things that they, they want to change. One, a couple of people did mention that I thought was interesting was perhaps doing some sort of a panel discussion. I thought that's an interesting idea. Uh, I will think on that and see if I can figure that out. That would take some coordination. I might need to find somebody to help me moderate. But I, I've thought about that myself, so that is something I'm considering. I asked what kind of topics you thought we should cover. Uh, they've got a lot of ones there, and some of them I have covered in the past, and I'm sure these are ones that I probably should just probably just cover periodically. You know, things like recommendations for products and services, you know, VPNs, email providers, DNS providers, cloud storage, you know, IoT devices, things like that. Um, I will say that, you know, check out, the, check out my blog and check out the book. There's a lot of stuff in there. If you want to look for recommendations, I've probably done an article on some of those things at some point. Some people have asked about how to, you know, manage their online identity, which I, th I my guess is probably that's around privacy and privacy settings. Also, you know, security settings for, for products and services. And some, somebody asked about ethical alternatives as well. Um, I'm not sure ethical in what sense, if they mean like uh, ones that are private or secure, or maybe ones that are not associated with I don't know, unethical business models or products, uh, but I, I understand that as well. 
I will try to make some space, you know, every so often for some sort of a product spotlight or a service spotlight where I bring something up. A lot of times, actually, it's in reference to one of the guests that I have, like when uh, we talked to uh, Helen from Fastmail. Um, but I will take a mental, mental note of that and see if I can't work that uh, more more frequently into the into the show. As far as, uh, you know, as for people that I should interview, of course, Edward Snowden came up. I would love to interview Edward Snowden. I've actually made some requests in that regard just to see because I do know people that uh, know him or at least know people that know people that know him. So, you know, uh, I will try. I cannot make promises. Others included, you know, security experts like Brian Krebs. Not to be confused with Chris Krebs. They are not related. Brian Krebs has got a great uh, Krebs on Security blog. And Chris Krebs was the person that worked in the CISO office, I think, at the U.S. government that Trump fired uh, for saying that the election was not rigged. Someone else, uh, Moxie Marlinspike, who I've talked about many times. He's basically the security guru behind Signal. Really, really interesting guy, uh, an activist. I would love to bring him on the show. And I've I've tried a couple ways to get him to, and uh, that's probably <laughs> that's probably not going to happen either. We'll see. I'll I'll, I'll keep trying. And then I, a couple of people mentioned bringing on, I'm paraphrasing here, but basically regular people. In other words, interview, instead of finding some security experts, find some people maybe with stories to tell. And I think that's a great idea. So uh, I will be thinking on that as well. Now, uh, I did say that if you gave me your email address on the listener survey, that I would put you in a drawing for a free PDF copy of the book. And for those that entered, thank you. And for those that gave your email address, I pulled out a random one and the, uh, the username was just admin. It was at a funky email address. So I will be emailing you later today and you'll know for sure that uh, who I'm talking about. Uh, and I'll send you a link to download a free copy of my book. Thank you very much for filling out the, the survey. Everybody, thank you to all of you that filled out the survey. And we will do that again next year. Uh, of course, you can always you know email me. You can send uh, email to feedback at firewallsdon'tstopdragons.com at any time. Um, but I will be doing the formal survey once a year, and uh, when it comes right again, I highly encourage you to fill it out. It really helps me to know how best to help you. All right, one more thing real quick. I did get another podcast review. Thank you. It's from Mr. R.W. It was uh, dropped on January 31st. Sorry if I missed that until now. It was four out of five stars. It says, great info for newbies and professionals. I've only been listening for a few months, but in that time, this podcast has become an essential listen. I enjoy the interviews and all the helpful suggestions. Sometimes this reminds me of a couple of books, Scam Me If You Can and Fishing for Fools, where fools is also spelled with a PH. And then he said, now I just need an audio edition of his book, Smiley Face. And I, I honestly didn't think that was really going to be something possible, uh, especially since my book has got so many figures and diagrams and things like that in it. But I reached out to my publisher and I just on a whim and said, well, th th this is not the first person who's actually asked for an audio version of the book. And, and she said, no, we do do that. And, uh, so she's actually going to put my, uh, put my book in for review on that to see if that's a possibility. And if that happens, I will certainly let you know. So thank you, Mr. RW. And thanks to all of you who have left me reviews. They really, really help. Uh, I very much appreciate that. So just a reminder, I am adding some really cool new stuff for my Patreon subscribers. I've started gathering some bonus content from my interviews. So I'll, you know, questions that are kind of outside the regular realm of, of the subject at hand. Uh, I'm starting to collect some extra bonus content, and that will become available to patrons sometime in the next month or two. And I've already been adding some other cool stuff. So if you haven't been to patreon.com lately, check that out. Go to Firewalls Don't Stop Dra or search for Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons there, and you can see what's already there, and I'm going to be adding more stuff soon. I got some... Really cool stuff come up on the horizon uh, that I want to talk about, but I can't, I can't talk about just yet. I've got three interviews already in the can waiting to be distributed to you guys. Uh, one that's going to start next week is from a really interesting group called the Tech Learning Collective, and they're in New York City. But uh, I don't know if it was because of COVID or maybe they've always done this, but they have some really interesting online classes. And it's hard to describe this interview, but these guys are basically there. It's They're not about doing this you know, learning these, you know, cybersecurity and privacy skills to make a living, they're there because the people that they want to teach really need to know this stuff, like for their livelihood. Basically, it's like a self-defense class or set of classes. They've got many classes. Um, I had a really great discussion. You're not going to want to miss that. So part one will air next week and then part two after that. Uh, I've also got an interview with Phil Zimmerman, the creator of Pretty Good Privacy. I've been trying to get that together for a while. He lives in Northern Europe, and that took us a little while to get that kind of set up, but that's done in the can. It's going to take some editing, but the, that will be coming, I'm guessing, probably in April. And between the two, 
I have an interview with John Davison from Epic or the Electronic Privacy Information Center. And I think, I think he's the first person I've interviewed from Epic and I've been trying to get someone there for a long time. We have a great discussion there too. So lots of stuff already coming. I've got other interviews in the works. So plenty of great stuff coming your way. If for some reason you haven't, go ahead and subscribe and that way you won't miss any of the goodness. All right, that's going to do it this week. Thanks for tuning in. Tell a friend about the podcast, put it on your social media, spread the word. The vaccines are rolling out, folks. There is a light at the end of this tunnel. Make sure you're in line to get yours when they come up. Until then, wear a mask, maybe wear two, and stay indoors when you can. So until next week, everybody, stay safe, and don't get caught with your drawbridge down.